Hello, everybody, and welcome to Libromancy, a podcast about the magic of books. I'm Josh, and today I'm talking about Searching for Dragons by Patricia C. Reed. So let's search for the magic of books. So again, this is the second book in the, uh, not again, but this is the second book in the Enchanted Forest Chronicles. And I have to say, I really think that Patricia C. Reed did it again. She wrote an amazing book. It's super funny. It's super engaging and hilarious and has a good kind of story to tell with good morals or a good kind of theme behind it, right? So I really love this book. Uh, There's multiple covers for it. Now, let me just tell you guys, first off, I like the old cover, the oldest of the old covers here. The cover I like the most is the Searching for Searching for Dragons is the one with uh, King Mendebar and Prince Simorine on a magic carpet with teddy bears on it. It's just hilarious. That's the one I read the first time, and so that's the one that I really love the most. I am not a huge fan of the newer covers, but if they help other people read the books and find the books, then that is just fine with me, and I don't end up caring that much about it. So let's talk some non-spoilery things. I think this book did most of the same things that the first book did, and I, I have a tough time saying which one did them better. Probably dealing with dragons just a little better because it's the first and that makes it kind of more novel and more original but when you redo it um, sometimes it can lose a little bit of that even if it's technically just as good but I think her writing was on point I think her characters were on point again I like that she has more varied cu- uh, characters I'm well we can still talk about the, the antagonists a little bit they're still kind of just mustache twirling wizards but that's kind of the point of it is that they're the mustache twirling wizard- wizards As far as like the atmosphere of what she writes and like how kind of you feel, I always felt like I was in the moment with the characters and that is good. I mean, but I never, I don't really feel like I was like, oh man, I can really feel that I'm in the mountains or I can really feel like I'm in the forest. I mean, this book is all from a certain point of view. And so when we're in the forest, we kind of get more of that feeling that he, that the main character feels, you know, more comfortable in the the enchanted forest than not. And uh, that makes sense from what our perspective is. But I I can't can't say that the atmosphere is like so descriptive and, and revealing, but that's not what the purpose of the book is. And so it's okay. And especially when you remember, these are, yes, again, remember, you know, middle age to younger age kid books. That's going to be expected that maybe they're not as interested in everything like that. Yeah, You know, I already said I love these books. So the enjoyment level and the uh, wanting to keep reading level is just off the charts for me. I just had such a hard time putting them down because they're so fun and light. All right. And let's talk plot for a second here. We're going to get into the spoilers here. Sorry, you know, it's so early, but there's really not much to talk about it without going into some details about this book. But the plot is, is that we are following King Mendenbar of the Enchanted Forest. He uncovers that something has happened in the Enchanted Forest. Part of the magic's been sucked dry, creating this dead spot. He finds some dragon scales, consults some people, mainly Morwen and... Uh, Zeminar kind of visits him, the head wizard, and points him in the direction of the dragons. Morwen helps him figure out that actually it's just from one dragon, sends him off to Cimmerine, where he is kind of afraid of meeting with Princess Cimmerine because every princess he's met has kind of had that vapid, oh, I just do what I do because I have to do it. And so he goes and he meets Princess Cimmerine. They kind of hit it off a little bit. We learn that Kazul has been missing and that she should have returned and she hasn't. They go on an adventure reluctantly together. Oh, and I have to just say the chapter titles again are just so on point for this book. I know it's in the middle of our kind of plot, but let's just talk about a couple of them, you know, uh, in which Mendenbar and Cimmerine have a long talk and Mendenbar reluctantly decides to embark on a journey. And they're both like, I don't want you to come with me. And he's like, I don't want to come with you, but I guess we have to just because that's kind of the right thing to do. We need to help each other. Uh, when, when, in which the chapter in which Mendenbar and Cimmerine are very busy, you know, it's funny, in which Mendenbar cleans up. The chapter in which everyone argues. They're just so funny and they're so like perfect for what is going to happen in that one. So let's continue on. The meet Balamore and Dublin, who they do a little bit of job consulting with him. They borrow a carpet, they fly, it breaks. They meet uh, Herman and Telemane the magician. And they also meet Gypsy Jack, who is a, a fun character, Jack of all trades. And so she's really good at playing with this wordplay some more, where she's like, oh, he's a Jack of all trades. So, you know, he, they explain it and it makes a funny joke. And okay, let's, we'll keep going on. I'm sorry. They end up making it back to the, the Enchanted Forest after figuring out that the wizards have kind of imprisoned castle somewhere in the enchanted forest either to spark a war between the wizards and the dragons and the enchanted forest or just to cause more mayhem so they can suck up more magic you know without people being aware and potentially getting back into the caves of night and fire so 
they end up finding Casual. They figure some stuff out. They go back to <laughs> this is such a, a funny part. They go back to the uh, the castle and they meet Crown Prince Roderick or Robert. Excuse me. They meet Prince uh, Crown Prince Jorillium and Prince Rupert. I had a little bit of a conflation of those two in my head for a second there. Um, the it's so funny. Prince Rupert ha- is part of the. Let me make sure I I say this completely right. The Right Honorable Wicked Stepmother's Traveling, Drinking, and Debating Society in the Men's Auxiliary. And he accidentally got handed the keys to the the kingdom, basically. The parents went off on an adventure. He's supposed to be wicked. He doesn't really want to do anything wicked. And then they're starting to argue, and they're like, okay, you guys can go up to this dungeon. It's just so funny. And then everybody else is kind of arguing, okay, how are we going to take out the wizards? How are we going to stop them? Who's coming with with me? And Minibar's like, I'm just going to go in and scout. And everybody else is like, oh no, we're all coming with you. And it's just such a funny chapter. So hilarious. They go in, they fight the wizards, they rescue Kazul, and, you know, that's the end of the story. Well, except for the fact that, you know, Mandanbar and Samorin uh, get together and get married at the end of it. Of course, it's just, uh, it, it's, you could say that it's a rush thing, but of course we're not experiencing every minute traveling with these guys. Plus, it's kind of like almost expected when you're reading this story that like this is what's going to happen because you know marriage is hinted at a lot in this and surprisingly some people i I was looking at some reviews online and i know i shouldn't look at the one star reviews but sometimes with books i really like i just like to look at them and say what was so bad about this book that you gave it a one star review and then had to write and one person wrote like a huge essay on this book and i'm like dude it's a kid's book like chill out like it's it's okay that it's not like adult level fantasy with like ridiculously intricate characters and world building and stuff like the foreshadowing was a little bit much yeah because they're kids and as kids we're all dumb and we don't see foreshadowing unless it like smacks us in the face with it right like so of course you can see that they're going to get together you're like an experienced adult with a lot of reading behind you like chill (laughs) but uh one thing i didn't like was that some one person said in the first book, it's all about how she doesn't need a man. In the second book, she just ends up getting married at the end of it. And I'm like, did she, the whole point of the first book was that she wanted to do what she wanted to do. She didn't want to get married, so she didn't get married. In this book, she wants to get married, so she gets married. She didn't want to get married to Thrandell from the first book because he's a horrible person. Well, no, he's not a horrible person, but he's a horrible match for her. He doesn't like anything. He doesn't do anything. She couldn't talk to him or have conversations, right? But Mendenbar and Simorine, like, they actually have conversations and they talk and they understand each other. Like, it makes a lot of sense. But let's just talk about some of my favorite parts of this book because this whole book is just favorite parts, right? But let's talk about some of the exceptionally favorite parts for me. Okay, I talked about it already, but the Right Honorable Wicked Stepmother's Traveling, Drinking, and Debating Society, the Men's Auxiliary, that was just hilarious. Uh, And the plan where he's like, okay, we'll take him to the Enchanted Forest and I'll just get him lost. But then they end up running into the wizards and they have to run. And he doesn't really want to leave him, but he has to be wicked or he loses his membership and that's where all of his friends are. And he's always kind of in this thing. It's like, okay, well, let's take him to the dungeon. And then, so funny that at the beginning of the book, the Willem, uh, the steward basically of the castle is like you know this dungeon is missing a rack and it needs a rack because your great great grandmother used it to dry tablecloths and it never got put back and then you know she remembers it and she brings it up here when crown prince jorion is, is looking in the, the dungeon he's like there's no there was no rack in the dungeon how was i supposed to get tortured and he's like well if there had been a rack i wouldn't be com- i'd be complaining about it that i had to get used on it right so i'm going to complain either way and just so funny and then uh king Mendenbar comes up with the idea he's like well why don't you just send him to a boarding school because he's supposed to you know, obviously, according to the fairy tale tradition, he has to come back and save the kingdom from his st- wicked step uncle, right? And so he's like, you know what? That's a great idea because that'll be good for him. And he won't like it. So I'm definitely wicked by making him do something he doesn't want. And then I get to run the kingdom. And then he shows up at the wedding with the huge villain handlebar mustache and like the dashing black coat. Oh, so funny and just hilarious because everybody's like, it's just hilarious. Everybody is in on it and knows that like he's not really wicked, but he has to do it to fulfill the role. Let's talk about Herman. Herman is a Rumpelstiltskin character, right? He spins it into gold. He, you know, they have to guess his name, but then he ends up, nobody can remember his name. And he's like, I did it every time. I even changed my name to Herman to make it easier for people to remember. Like, it's not hard, but I keep failing. And like, (laughs) 
<laughs> so funny. And so I think that's kind of a, that was kind of what I felt like the theme of this book was when I read it this time, is that you do things for the right reasons, or you do things that used to work or that, that you should be doing, and it doesn't work, or something has to change. Just like in the previous book, it was Simmerine, you know, you should be able to do what you want, and you want to live your own life and not just have to live to the expectations of others or like what's proper or what's right. But so this book was all about, you know, being like, he's doing it right. He's trying to, you know, succeed where others have in the same way, but he can't do it and others couldn't do it. You know, it was just funny. There's the the lion who's guarding the lake of uh, dipping gold, right? And he's like, oh, I thought if I'd catch them up at the bend, then I could get ahead of them and stop them from getting closer to it. And King Brendanbar's like, well, yeah, but like, what if somebody distracts you and goes around and the drag and the lion's like, oh yeah, I guess I'll go back. But then as the lion's walking off, he's like, but they never go on. If it's a prince, they always stop. They're never, you know, and it's just like, they have to play to their story. When they visit Doblin, and uh, this is so funny, this is one of my favorites, of course, when they visit Doblin and Balamor the Giants to, to get a magic carpet to fly to where Kazul was, or where they thought Kazul was, um, they're talking and he's like, every month somebody comes into our castle, our house, you know, because we're giants, and takes, you know, some coins and some food and a magic harp, and Balamor's like, it's okay, we can afford to give out harps every so often, and we can afford to give out some coins, it's not that big of a deal, and Doblin's main complaint is like, yeah, but every single one of them is named Jack, there's not a Tom, a Dick, a Harry among them. It's been Jack for 30 years, and it'll be Jack for another 30 years. It's just pretty funny and hilarious. And then he's going like, I can't get sick. And he's like, I don't want to go out raiding anymore. But he's like, but I got to pay the bills. And Mendebar's like, well, what if you just went into consulting? You know, I hear consulting pays pretty good. You can just consult other giants on how to, like, do the ravaging and the pillaging and how to do this better and that better. And you can advise the towns how to, you know, defend against giants better and what not to do. And He's like, you know what? That's it. I'm going to do it. And he does it. It's just, it's so funny because it's like, oh yeah, I'll just consult instead of doing, you know, the thing. <laughs> okay, let's talk some characters for a second. We got to talk about Telemain. He is hilarious. He's a magician. And magician is uh, just somebody who uses multiple methods of magic. He's a big researcher. And he has the most tech speak you could ever hope for. Everything is super complicated and over the top and like wordy explanations. And the whole time... You know, Mendebar has to just translate it, you know, to translate it down to Cimmerine. And it's funny. And I didn't ever feel like it was like being mean to Cimmerine. It was just like nobody can understand it. But Mendebar has the, the correct little understanding to do that. But then when Telamine meets Kazuo and Kazuo's like, hey, uh, do you want to say that again? He's like, <clears throat> yeah, the magic did a bad thing. And he like tones it down really small, you know, really easily for everybody. And everyone's just like, ah, oh, you can talk normally. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's what I said earlier. But he says it a little bigger until Casual Eyes, but then he kind of starts talking, you know, uh, gently again. It's hilarious. Telemine is so funny. Morwen, of course, is always so good. Mendenbar, he's the king. He is crowned king at 17. I like Mendenbar a lot. He's kind of just like, a, I got to do this. I'm going to be do what I need to do and help out. He's a fun character. Uh, let's talk about Antero a little bit. He's still a bad wizard. He still sucks. And the wizards, yes, they are a little bit mustache twirling, right? They, they're they evil for evil's sake because they just want more power. Again, I don't really think this is a huge issue because like, this is a children's book, you know, middle-aged, young adult book. And it's good to have nuance, but it's also good to just say, yeah, he's just a bad guy because he's a bad guy. And good can triumph over bad or it cannot, right? Like Kazuo was captured for a little while. It doesn't make it a bad book just because the villain is not like a fully fleshed out huge person. Obviously, that can make a book much better, but I don't think it hurts this book at all. So uh, that's going to wrap up my discussion of Searching for Dragons. Everybody, it's a fun book. It's hilarious. It's definitely well worth a read. You could read it to your kids. It's simple. It's fun. It's exciting. Uh, I highly recommend it to everybody. Thanks for listening, everybody, though. And thanks to David Hillowitz for the intro and outro music. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to libromancypod at gmail.com. If you have any book suggestions you think I'd really like or that I should read and cover on the podcast, you know, send me an email there as well. Please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. And remember to search for the magic of books. <laughs> <laughs>